All right, chapter eight, water resources, 8.1 to 8.4. Um, no doubt about it, water is, our, or water, as you guys said, is our number one resource issue in the world. If you ask anybody in the world, this is where the rubber hits the road. You can say it's climate change, you can say it's pollution, but where it really focuses on people is lack of water or uh, water that's polluted. Because even to our health, most of our diseases are waterborne. Even though most of our diseases, cholera, diphtheria, things like that, uh, just diarrhea itself um, that kills lots of children in uh, third world countries, okay? So, water is a replaceable resource. Uh, sorry. Uh, fresh water is irreplaceable. Um, and so we need to manage it. The hydrological cycle, we should know all about this. We'll take a quick look at it at the moment. Water continents, we have the haves and the have-nots, just as we have in other, every other resource. But I think it's particularly significant here. We actually, funnily enough, live in a have-not, right? Without the big water supply system that I'm gonna start introducing to you today, that comes from Northern California. Northern Californians for years have told us that we steal their water, which is partially true. Um, comes right in the California Aqueduct State Water Project, right through Hesperia here. None of us could live here. And I uh, don't wanna ever live in LA because that's such a tenuous water supply that they might be a have not quite easily. Okay, earthquake happens to go right over the San Andreas Fault. Terrorism, uh, LA is going to dry up in a hurry. We won't, interesting enough. You're going to hear that story tomorrow about how Mojave manages their water. We're going to hear the Mojave water story. Okay. All right, so there we go. A little bit hard to see. You can see it all a bit better later when you're online. Um, basically, the hydrological cycle, what we're looking at is, um, let's start here with a water body like the ocean. We have evaporation goes up, condenses into the clouds. Onshore winds, which is often the way winds blow during the day, hotter inland, low pressure, blows towards that. Uh, and so, and then so we have, and then we balls up against mountains. We have precipitation, surface runoff. Some of that surface water goes underground into our groundwater, and we're gonna talk about that in detail a little bit. And then all goes over, hopefully on our side of the mountains here, the, on the rain shadow side, and we get transpiration from trees, because remember, they also give off water. How do we get clouds and, and build up around the side? The, the trees actually transpire, and we get condensation, and we can have another little cycle over here. So more important, let's look down at the bottom here at California's situation. Because as we talked about earlier, it's all about the climate and also about the topography. So first thing I want to look at is Pacific Ocean, right? Right there, the cold ocean current. So that's going to cut down on evaporation. Coastal ranges, we don't have them right here, but, but um, the strict coastal ranges, but you can think of the Santa Monica's right there at the Cajon Pass and the San Bernardino's is like our coastal ranges. Then we have the Great Valley which is the San Joaquin Valley, Bakersfield, all the way north, where we grow all the agricultural food. We just learned about that last week. Also very dry. Then we have the Sierra Nevada, and then we have the Great Basin. So this is a profile going through more like San Luis Obispo. If you guys have ever been up there. Coastal Range, the Great Valley, which is the San Joaquin Valley, our, our food basket of the world, richest agricultural area in the world, Sierra Nevada and then Great Basin. So each time as we go over this, we're not gonna go into huge detail, but you see as we go up, evaporation, transpiration, rains on this side. Moisture rich AMS rises of the coastal mountains, cools, condenses, and precipitation occurs. Okay, if it's higher enough, it could be in snow, otherwise it's in rain. On the other side though, um, Sinking air, got it over there, sinking air warms and becomes relatively drier. As it warms, it actually sucks air out. 
So if you're trying to grow tomatoes and vegetables here in the Mojave Desert, you know in those spring days when we get those winds coming this way, you come, you water your, your tomatoes in the morning, you come home at night and they're just completely given up. They're all wilted and stuff. That's partly because it's hot, but also because literally those winds are drying it out, causing them to transpire. This side is called a rain shadow where the air is dropping and warming. The rain shadow, we don't get as much rain, okay? We're in that side. So on this side of the mountains, let's just look at Rancho Cucamonga, down below LA, about 15 inches of rain. Outside, eight inches average, okay? As we go further across, if we go across here and we head out to, let's say, uh, Needles, the time we get to Needles and we've gone over a few mountain ranges, what is it? Two inches, three inches, okay? So as we get away from the ocean, it gets drier and drier. Only saving thing is we also have the Gulf of Mexico and the Sea of Cortez and rain comes up from them. Monsoon rains in the summer. We had a bit of those here. They come up and that's a different cycle, okay? So real quick, that's how we get the water in the first place. All right, so aquifers. This is the name of the game locally. We'll see in a moment that all our water that you use on a daily basis comes from underground, comes from the aquifer, okay? And you guys got to see on the field trip and over in our department, you'll see it again tomorrow. We have a, a model of what that aquifer looks like, right? Sand, gravel, clay, mixture of stuff that the water sits between. In a few places, you have underground caverns and space between rocks, but locally, it's these sediments, right, that the water sits in. The top of where it's saturated, if you looked at that model, where the water was saturated, is called the water table, right? That's really critical, and that's what we were measuring. That's what we're going to measure. Um, we measured on the field trip. And that's what we're, you're gonna look at again more tomorrow, is we measure the top of the water table. If we're gonna sink a well, you know, let's say this is Hesperia, well, Hesperia Water District there well, we gotta get below that water table because sink a well down, it's a plastic pipe as you saw, and it's got perforations on it, could be metal pipe, perforations on it. It's not gonna pick up any water if it's sitting up here. I didn't get to tell you that, you guys, that, but one of my sad stories out there is I actually drilled a well that landed probably right there just because I was being somewhat stupid, okay? I wasn't looking at the data properly. Okay, so that's how it infiltrates. How does it get in there? Well, it infiltrates. Here in the Mojave River, we're going to see on our last field trip, it infiltrates really well because it's real sandy comes in and they've actually been letting water out of, of the state water project out of Silverwood the last little bit. If any of you have gone up Deep Creek, you'll see they've been letting water out. A friend of mine at church yesterday was showing how he tried to cross the river in his Jeep and didn't realize there was a deep hole and, and there's a lovely picture of the water over the top of his Jeep. Uh, so that's what happens. You don't expect that in the Mojave River, but they've been recharging this. Putting water up here, or this would be a good example, putting water in there so that it can recharge the aquifer, bring it back up. Because obviously as we suck out of these straws, all these wells, we deplete it. Okay. All right, water tables rise and fall, obviously. Unconfined aquifers, that's when there's nothing to block it, okay? so. Um, the thing that we struggled with the other day was we started talking about, and I think you need a bit more background, is how does an aquifer become confined? Let's go, if we go out here to the river, it's sand, silt, and, 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 and gravel, and you keep going down. Now, over time, there might have been a change, and all of a sudden, a layer of clay was laid down. Very fine particles, okay? That will confine the aquifer above and below. Well, it actually will confine the one below because clay, when you wet it, if you've ever done it, that's why we, everybody has a ceramic jug here or coffee cup, but it binds together when you wet it and, and, and it binds together so it forms an impermeable layer. Remember us talking out there in Lucerne Valley about that fault line, how the fault line, the, 
Lucerne Valley, Hellendale Fault moves like this, form that flower. Well, that's clay-like material, very fine. Water comes up again, it becomes a barrier. We talked about how the water on the top side where we were taking that water sample on the side of the road, how that was higher than down into Lucerne Valley. Well, that's a confined aquifer, okay? They're non-renewable because they can't be recharged. This one is renewable, the unconfined, and that's what we work with here in the Mojave, is unconfined aquifer. Because basically, if you think of it, the relationship you make is we don't have big lakes to store water in. Silverwood Lake isn't for us, it's for LA and down below. And therefore, we need to store underground. So we have these underground lakes, as it were, storing the water. Okay, 100% surface water. Obviously, it's surface runoff. And then the second thing we want to look at, what is a watershed, okay? So a watershed, really simply, and I forgot to bring my big map that I was going to bring of California. But if you look at the mountain, let's pretend this is the Mojave, Mojave River here. There's a town, let's call that Victorville. Uh, agriculture going on, let's call that um, Newbury Springs, although that would be down here. Um, and then there's a riparian zone close to water where plants grow naturally, a riparian zone, and down here at the Lewis Center, it's a riparian zone, there's a wetland which is down there. Now if we look up from there, if we look up into the mountain behind us there, up on the San Bernardinos, there's going to be a spot up there where water is either going to flow this way or it's going to flow that way to ranches to the Santa Ana River. Okay, which is on the other side of Big Bear. Okay, so our watershed is everything along that watershed, along that line, right? The ridge flows this way, and that's how we define a watershed. Anytime water, it could be in a stream or it could be underground, could go in and move underground. Because amazingly enough, here in the Mojave, we don't have a lovely water river like this. It's it's dry most of the year, but it's, but water is continually moving down from the mountain, okay? And undergrounds coming through those layers and recharging. And we'll look at that a little bit in a moment and look at it tomorrow. That's what Mojave Water Agency manages. They make sure that that recharge from our watershed, either coming from Lake Silverwood, which is, which is part of the deal we have with, with the cities down below, or by coming off the mountain, we have to make sure that balance if we don't, we have got overdraft. We're using more water than we have, okay? And we've been able to maintain that pretty close so far based on a few things and also based on really good management, okay? So real quick, if you look down below here, the green, can't see it too well, but you'll be able to see in your notes, just shows what the watershed, shows the mountain here very vaguely, but that's our watershed all the way coming down. And we tend to expand that a little bit. We call Lucerne Valley and our watershed, even the water flows towards its own basin in Lucerne Valley, but we expand that a little bit. So that's a watershed, very key, really key piece of information. Okay, um, we are increasing amounts, we're using increasing amounts of, the water, of our water sources. Uh, climate scientists agree, I, a lot of talk we've seen from these hurricanes the past few years last this lot past year we're going to get more rain possibly in certain areas but they'll be in storm events they'll be in sudden downpour so that means we have to collect that water we either have to build more dams or fortunately here we can just collect it right in our base and let it go into the ground okay so uh, that's what we need to do more sustainable groundwater management act it's going to create a huge number of jobs probably the, the think tanks think that this one piece of legislation will create more jobs in California than anything else. Because now we've said to everyone, whether it's here, where we are already forced to manage our water, and that's because we have a judge's order adjudication from 25 years ago that when Barstow sued us up here, saying, hey, we're not getting our water, so we were forced to start managing. And that's what Mojave Water Agency does. But everywhere else in the state, groundwater is open season, pioneer days. If I've got a big rig, and we'll see what the rigs look like in a little bit, and I can drill a deeper well in the San Joaquin Valley like the almond growers can, because they got lots of money, then they go down deeper, and guess what? If you're upslope, 
and your well's lower than, higher than theirs, you run out of water because they're pulling it from underneath you. Okay? So this law came in place two years ago and they're going to form, have to have agencies and plans to manage the water sustainably in all of California's groundwater. Okay? And that's going to be absolutely key and there's very few people that really know how to do this. The people at Mojave Water Agencies are recognized as, as the best in the state, which gives you guys locally a bit of an up, uh, uh, an advantage. Okay, uh, water footprint. How do we really use our water? Flushing toilets, 27%. Of course, the low water ones are one gallon versus five gallons now. That helps a lot. Washing clothes, taking showers, running faucet, wasted from leaks. So that's our urban use, okay? So that's our urban use. Let me just throw in right now, and this isn't in your notes, but you need to write this down. You need to look at where our water is used in California. These, these, these numbers will be on several tests, and they will be especially very important next semester when we do the water management class. Tw only 20% of our water is used for urban use. That's industry and people, towns, okay? And that's what that's looking at. More importantly, 40%, 39% is used for, um, for agriculture, okay? So we're gonna have a lecture, uh, well, you're gonna have a lecture online that you can look at. The, the Granite Hills people are gonna have an irrigation lecture, and we're gonna go and see irrigation at the end of the class on our field trip. So how we irrigate, don't flood irrigate, but irrigate uh, with drip irrigation and these very efficient leaper systems, these boom systems, really important. 20% urban, so this is all really important. The one they left out here, and this is from the book, is landscape. It actually turns out that landscaping uses, about locally it uses about 70% of our water, outdoor use. So if anything we can do for landscaping, Water efficient plants, native plants, drip irrigation is huge. So I don't really like this slide, but this is in your house, kind of, kind of where you can save water. The third part of water use, 20% urban, 39% agriculture. The third one is environmental. What do you think that means? What does it mean, environmental? So if I say environmental use, put an example of environmental. This is a pretty new category. In the old days, we didn't worry about this. Any ideas? So the salmon. We've got to keep our rivers by law now. We've got to keep our rivers flowing. We've got to keep these wetlands, like the one here at, at the Narrows here. We've got to keep them going and the riparian areas. We've got to make sure there's enough water and habitat in the Mojave River for an endangered species called the Arroyo Toad, okay? It's a little frog, okay? Uh, that's environmental uses. We gotta keep water in the environment. We can't just suck it all up, let's say it's from the Sacramento Delta, and ship it down to California. That's where this aqueduct that comes through is spirit. It comes all the way from the Sacramento Delta, okay? All the way from San Francisco. Winds it one day down the San Joaquin Valley. There's a fish in there. The, uh, I'm trying to think of its name right now. In the, in the Sacramento Delta. Yeah, the little silver guy, come on, Neville. See, I can put but Anyway, there's a fish in there's in danger. We can't turn on the pumps at certain times of the year to ship that water south because of that fish. I'll think of it. Okay. All right. Um, more, than, more than enough renewable fresh water however unevenly distributed and polluted okay we've talked about that the water is not here it's in Canada they have more water than they can throw a stick at in Canada but they have very few people in Africa that's where all the people are that's where the growth is happening Asia not as much water and the desert smell Delta smell desert smell Delta smell S M L E L T floods Pollution, droughts, they're all affecting our renewable fresh water source that we live on. Okay? Water spots. Where is it that hot spots? Where do we have issues in, in, in the United States? Okay? We have issues in 
California, our little area here. We have all the way through the San Joaquin Valley is red, the Central Valley, the big valley they talked about. Up there in the Sacramento Delta, they have water issues. All the way in various issues, places where they have lots of people, right? Look at it, how much is on the west. Most of it's on the west because we're much drier on the west coast, on the west side of the United States, okay? So uh, there's water issues everywhere. And there's a high, high likely of a conflict potential. Okay, so you're like, what are you talking about? Are there wars locally happening? Not exactly, but, um, but there's a big, let me just give you an example. There's a big development going, proposed for Hesperia, right? The, boy, my mind is off today. Tapestry, thank you very much. The tapestry project, about the size of Hesperia, over on the south side of Hesperia towards Summit Valley. Huge controversy, they've already been sued because where will they get the water from, okay? And a lot of people realize, and I don't think they do have the water supply. They have to guarantee a 20 year supply by California state law, okay? So we'll see, I doubt that the project will ever happen because where's the water come from? We're already barely managing the number of people that we have now, okay? All right, drought monitor. Obviously, we, this was in 2015, got a lot worse in 20, 2016, and then all of a sudden broke. The northern part of the state up broke in, uh, in 2017. Southern part of the state, we just barely got an average rainfall. So we're still technically in this drought. Okay, freshwater shortages will grow because of dry climates, because of drought, too many people, wasteful water use, potential co conflicts, wars over water. So if you're in the Middle East, you often think of those wars as being about oil, but, and, and, tr and issues between different ethnic groups, but often they're also around water. Because, um, and there's a case study that we're not gonna go into that's in the book that you guys can look at. I've got some slides on that, but we're not gonna discuss that about the Middle East, okay? Expanding our watersheds. So how did we do this? We have our little watershed here. How did we expand it? LA has its little watershed. Problem with both of our watersheds, we don't get a lot of rain to shed into our supply, right? So we had them put in artificial man-made systems. They're dams, they're aqueducts, they're pumps. And so we make a virtual watershed. We were just fortunate enough to be able to do that in Northern California. And we take advantage of that in here, down here in Central and Southern California, okay? Uh, so 75% people in demand for water is south of Sacramento. 75% of the supply comes from north of Sacramento. And it's distributed in an intricate system of canals and dams and pumping. We use, for example, 17% of our energy is used to pump water, our electricity, just to pump water, okay? Uh, see map 12, I think I've got that. Um, so, just a quick clarification for the text, and you'll see this often. You remember I said 39% or, excuse me, 41, I got those numbers right, change that. 41% for agriculture, 39% for environmental. Obviously what I gave you didn't add up to 100%. But you often see that 80% of the water is used for agriculture. So with the drought going on uh, through last year, agriculture was taking big hits in the, in the press for being wasteful and using all the water. And you often heard this figure bandied around. But what that is, it's 80% of the 41%. It excludes the 39% for environmental. If you take that, then agriculture and I think that's a fair way to look at it. Look at all the three big uses, urban, agriculture, environment. If you take that out, then it's closer to 75 to 80%. Take out the environmental component. Okay? Just a thing you'll see in a lot, of, a lot of material, a lot of text that is confusing. Okay? Expanding our watershed. Um, so, I don't think we have to get, so we don't have to get into the, the numbers. Uh, four major systems bring water 
sell and distribute. There's lots of tiny little systems, right? Um, all over the place. Um, not even very tiny, they're quite big, but there's four major systems of aqueducts and dams, okay? It one, the first one is called the Central Valley Project. That brings water from the north down into the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, and this is mostly for agriculture. This one, whoop. This is mostly for agriculture. Next one is Colorado River Project, and we'll look, go into that a lot in the water class in the spring. Uh, if you take it, you guys take it, the, the AA group will be taking it. And this is, is brought across the desert in big aqueducts. And it's agriculture and urban because that, those aqueducts come all the way across. The American aqueduct, the most southern one, comes to Palm Springs. All the way along, it feeds off, it grows a ton of vegetables and yeah, basically the veggie capital of the United States down there in the Imperial Valley and Coachella Valleys. The Colorado River Aqueduct is really unique. It comes all the way across, goes under the San Jacinto Mountains, they're 10, 11,000 feet, and comes out in San Jacinto and then distributes it down to San Diego and back to LA, into Lake Paris for one, okay? Uh, that's the Colorado River. The State Water Project, also called the California Water Project, is the one that we're at the very end of. And this is really critical, because we're at the very end of it. Once it dumps into Silverwood, it's done. And then from there, it becomes distribution down into LA. Actually, there's a huge, massive tunnel going through right at San Bernardino, uh, Cal State San Bernardino. Uh, it's about, I think, things like 40 feet wide. This, 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 uh, this, this underground uh, pipeline that takes the water underneath the San Bernardino Mountain. You can see it if you look up from 250 and you can see those pipes coming up the hill. That's it, coming out of the mountain, okay? State Water Project, so that's really critical. Uh, Los Angeles Project is in the Owens River Valley, coming down from uh, Big Pine and all those places, basically uh, coming all the way south and then going into LA. So those are the three biggest ones, project. Okay, there's a few more, Hetchy Hetchy, Mokome, Central Valley State Water Project, huge infrastructure. That's what those inset pictures are supposed to do. The biggest hydraulic man-made water system in the world is in California. We, we dwarf everyone else in terms of moving water around. Okay? And our economy depends on it, but it also means lots of jobs to fix it. State Water Project, comes all the way from the Feather River way north, uh, Lake Shasta, way up in the northern part of the state. Pull water from there, it comes down the Sacramento River for a while. Right at, at uh, south of Sacramento, it comes into a dam. I was fortunate to go there this past year, and then they pump it into the aqueduct, and it comes right down the, 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 uh, the valley. If you take the Highway 5 going north, Pay attention, because you'll cross it several times. This massive aqueduct, bigger than it is here because water's taken off before it gets here, okay? All right, uh, there it is, as it's coming through Palmdale area. State Water Project comes, like we all know, into Hesperia, through Hesperia. Um, so, we, the State Water Project can't solve all of our problems here. We still use more water than we can actually, than we can actually, is renewable in our area. We use about 50% more actually. And we have created paper water. And we'll, you'll start learning about that tomorrow. Basically, we, we buy water. So if Hesperia has so many water rights under the, under the adjudication, under the judge's order, they gave them so much rights, so much groundwater, if they go over that, they have to pay a lot of money for that. And they pay that to Mojave Water Agency, and Mojave Water Agency buys water from the State Water Project. That water then is recharged. So that water being let out of Silverwood the last few days, that was paid for. That water was coming back down here into our system to recharge. And that's how we balance it with paper water. And this is huge business, and that's why around here, locally, 
you've been lived here for a while, you know there used to be alfalfa fields all around us. Those have all gone because Jess Ranch and all those folks now sell their water to Hesperia or whoever wants to buy it. They sell those water rights because very, very valuable. About $5,000 for an acre foot per year. And you, you'd have a tough time making that kind of money with alfalfa. Okay, so we don't have to get into this a lot, but just know that it's very carefully managed locally and you're gonna learn a little bit more about that tomorrow. Okay, state water project features, 29 dams, 18 pumping plants, 444 miles long, coming all the way down California. Okay, that's the dam right there. Oroville Dam, if you're watching the news this last year, you know that's the dam that almost burst, right? They were literally having to go, there was so much rain up there and so much early runoff from the snow, they were actually going with helicopters and dropping massive boulders into, into the, uh, to the emergency overflow, to the, to, the, uh, to the spillway, because it was starting to get torn up. And they thought they would lose that whole dam. If they'd lost that whole dam, we would have lost about 25% of California's water. water. 50% of our water ultimately comes from the Sierra Nevada range, right? So all along the Sierra Nevada, especially up north, we get snow. And every year, that's why you'll hear in the spring, what are the snow levels? Because that's really, really critical. Last year, they were like double normal. The year before, they were like 5% of normal. So it's highly variable. And that's another place where we think climate change is going to have effect. Those variations are going to get more extreme, not less. Okay, Edmonston. State Water Project cannot actually deliver the amounts of water in its contracts. They created paper water. We talked a little bit about that. There's Mojave Water Agency. Shows where we're situated. These are all the agencies that have been designated to manage the water from the State Water Project. Okay, um, all the way down here to Antelope's up in there, Antelope Valley. All of those managed. We have the Mojave Water Agency. Matt Howard, one of our co-teachers, was going to talk to you about what they do and kind of their basic story to manage our water, which means they manage the state water, but more importantly, they manage the groundwater because that's ultimately where it comes from, even if we recharge it, right? All right, crisis all over the world. Um, where are we looking at water issues, high stress? Incredible to look and remember that we are in a high stress area. I don't think the people in LA really get this. They just turn on the tap. I don't think most people up here get it. The water's just there. You just turn on the tap and it's there and everything's cool. But we had no understanding of how hard it is to get a reliable, clean water supply to folks, okay? So you can see all across South here, we're gonna talk a little bit about desertification here in the Sahara. We talked about South Africa the other day. Right, we're gonna go through this really quickly. The Nile, the Jordan, the Tigris, Euphrates. Um, they flow through countries that have been traditionally at war. Iran and Iraq, before the United States got involved, we had war with each other. And that was because, I think it's Iran that's further up the watershed than Iraq. And a lot of that, that tension had to do with water supply, okay? So there's the pictures of it. We, you guys can kind of um, go over that a little bit. Now let's quickly focus in on groundwater for a moment. Uh, it's being withdrawn faster than it's being replenished. That's the word for that, you guys. If you don't get this, you gotta get this. It's called overdraft. Like your bank account, right? Like I tell my wife. No, I'm kidding. Draw, you know, don't overdraft more money than you've got. And that's the, the issue. And that's what it's all about. And for the whole of the state of California, ultimately it comes down to that. Because the little unknown secret is all through the drought, Cities kept going, uh, industry kept going, ag kept going, they had to cut back some. Environment, 
wasn't that badly damaged. But the untold secret was, as soon as they didn't have that surface water, so locally, we get an allotment given to us from the state water project every year. It got cut to zero for like three years in a row. It means we could get no water to recharge, which meant we had to stop. We were overdrafting. We were overdrafting in a known parameter in the San Joaquin Valley. All they do, the farmers do, is they turn on their pumps. Most of the year they get their water from the aqueduct, which whatever one it is, let's say Central Valley, Kern Friant is one of the little offshoots of the, of the Central Valley aqueduct. The rest of the time, if it's too dry, they cut that off and say you can't take any water from there. Then they turn on their pumps and now we start groundwater overdraft. Okay, um, So we got concerns of using deep aquifers. So that's happening locally. Okay, um, If we go to a very deep aquifer, so let's look around here. Where, where do you guys live? Who lives in Hesperia? Okay. What do you know about the quality of Hesperia water? How does it taste? Do you have to buy bottled water in Hesperia? You do? You shouldn't have to. It's coming pretty high up. Not very deep. Okay. Um, if you who lives in uh, Baldy, Um, so, who lives in Baldy Mesa, out towards Fila? Anyone? Okay. Out there, um, they're a little bit further away from the Mojave River, and that local recharge, and they have to go very deep. When they go deep, they go into those confined aquifers. They go through several layers of limestone, which, which makes a confined aquifer, and they go on, on, on down. Okay. Where I am, when I drilled my, missed the well. The first one, I, if I found water, would have been really good tasting, healthy, all of that. Now I have water that's a little more salty tasting, right? And that's because down deep, it's been down there so far, for so long that it actually dissolves salts and minerals from the rocks, okay? Ones we don't like, and scare us, even though we get a little bit overexcited about this, are things like arsenic. If you live in Baldy Mesa, they have to mix their water. They mix water from wells on this side with waters on wells on that side. This is the city of Victorville in that particular zone because the arsenic levels are too high, according to the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Another thing would be chromium-6. We're gonna go out to Hinkley and we're gonna learn about Erin Brockovich and her suing PG&E for the health of those people out there because of that artificial chromium-6 that got into the water and caused cancers. Or so it's reported. That's actually quite controversial as to whether what actually happened there. But if you go up into Oak Hills, they've got deep wells, and they actually have higher chromium-6 levels than most of Hinkley. Who lives in Oak Hills? You're not gonna die, okay. The cool thing about California, United States, their minimum contamination level, write this down, MCL. Because next lecture, pretty soon here, the rest of this chapter is gonna be on water pollution. Water, water pollution, MCL, minimum contamination level, is set by the Environmental Protection Agency. It could be statewide or California EPA. And they are so conservative, right? The people living in India that have a huge arsenic problem, they have 40 times more arsenic in their daily water, and that's causing health issues. Chromium-6, they think it'll have to be 10, 20 times more than whatever it is, the 3.5 parts per billion that it is right now, the MCL. But we set it very low and then we all have to conform. So really there are a lot of people that will tell you and we'll talk about it when we get to water pollution, but your water that you get out of your, out of your well, through your tap, in California, in the United States, unless you live in Michigan where they cheated, right? then you are actually safer drinking that water. 
It might not taste as good because it might have a little bit of chlorine because it might have had some bacteria in it, but it's actually safer than bottled water. Now is bottled water very often contaminated with the wrong things? Not. But the standards for bottled water and tap water are about the same and tap water in most areas is actually more stringent and it's hugely tested as we'll find out when you get out there. So, but that's not the same in all the world. Anyway, the groundwater uh, is being, being replenished. If we get down in the very deep wells, it's gonna, it's gonna have some contamination issues, okay? It's also gonna not taste as good. It's gonna be more salty tasting, more, more tedious, total dissolved solids. Okay. Uh, another part of the hydrologic cycle, so we think of the water cycle as being above ground, condensed station, but no, it's down below, right? And it's cycling through. Other than when it's very deep, and then it's just kind of confined there. And so we're, when it's then, then we have to drill very deep with our wells to start using. So in the spring, when we do, if you take the water class, which I'd highly recommend, because of all the jobs, is we'll go to a place near Needles called Cadiz, C-A-D-I-Z, very controversial water project, where they're actually mining some deep aquifers that are very good water, and they're ultimately trying to send it to water districts in LA. They're gonna use the California, the Colorado aqueduct to get it there. And they're actually gonna hook up to the Colorado aqueduct to get the water out that way. But it's highly controversial. Up till now, they've been held up because it's like, who does that water belong to? Does it belong to a private company or does it belong to the people, specifically the people of the Mojave Desert? And so there's a huge push and shove, a big water war going on about that. Okay, so there's your groundwater again, zone of aeration where there's no water, zone of saturation, water table, right at where it becomes saturated, uh, soil moisture belt, the more vegetation we have up here, grasses, trees, shrubs, very important. So, Northern California right now with those big fires, turns out that Santa Rosa is actually a sort of a separate watershed, doesn't affect our water supply, but fires anywhere really affect the watershed that you live in because when we had the big fires like the Blue Cut Fire and the other one out here, all that water now doesn't have a chance to filter in, it just washes off the top because those roots and the vegetation can't trap it. So fires are a huge influence on whether our watersheds are functioning properly because we need it to soak into the water here and then slowly infiltrate down to the water table. Okay. Uh, Victor Valley is a huge groundwater base, basin. There's going to be a little bit of repetition here. Uh, there's another picture of a more intricate uh, uh, groundwater water table look. We've got a treatment plant there. We've got, more, we've got a river. We've got irrigated agriculture. Big story in much of the United States of California is excess water, like when they flood irrigate will go off the land and infiltrate back to the groundwater. And, if, and then with it, we're gonna take chemicals, pesticides, and excess fertilizer, and we're actually gonna contaminate the water. So agriculture, again, why do we irrigate with drip? And make sure that the water just stays in the root zone. Agronomic rates, we call that, because we don't want it to run off because it's also gonna pollute the groundwater. Okay? Just like when we visit the dairy out there in Hinkley, we don't want the waste, the manure and the urine, to run off, pool, and get in the groundwater because it's going to take nitrates, a, a very serious contaminant, pollutant into the groundwater. And then the poor old people of Barstow will have issues with nitrates, right? They already drink all our sewerage water. Did you guys know that? Who lives in Barstow? Oh, you seem like such nice people. So, well, part of the Mojave River adjudication, when they sued us up here, we said, sure, okay, we'll do that. But you know what? One of the ways we're going to recharge for you 
is we're going to take our sewage water, we're going to take it in pipelines down to Victor Valley Wastewater Reclamation Plant, BBWRA. We're going to treat it there to drinking water standards, tertiary. Very, kind of unusual. LA is too lazy to do that. They pump theirs five miles out of the ocean, partially untreated. We treat to drinking water standards, even though we've visited there hundreds of times, Lynn and I, we've never had anybody actually walk from the treatment pond over here, 100 yards away and actually drink the water. Um, we had one crazy guy offering to do it once, but it's actually drinking water standards. It goes back into the river and into the groundwater and makes its way down to Barstow. And that's about 35% of the water we recharge back to Barstow through the adjudication, the Mojave River adjudication, is actually treated sewage water. That's why we kind of joke about it. So actually, if you look at us, because the hydrological cycle, you know, we often joke that the water, who's got water here? That water right there, you know, could be recycled from Napoleon's urine. Have you thought about that? It's the same water molecule. From our septic tanks. Oh, we will get to. I'm just going to say septic tanks are really a big issue because that water is bad, not very well treated. And it goes, and if it, if it has contact, if you're close to the river, it's going to leach in and it's going to take lots of nitrates stuff into the water and it's going to go to Barstow or go further down river and it's a big issue and and the dairies we as the resource conservation think that the dairies are being blamed for nitrates that are actually coming from septic tanks but they, they can't the Lahotan water board can't go after I should probably edit this but they can't go after individual people so they go after bigger entities okay Victor Valley Wastewater Treatment Plant only had to treat for nitrates starting about four years ago. After that, all used to go into the water. Okay, so uh, anyway, yeah, good, great question. But Matt will be doing a water pollution uh, thing, uh, uh, presentation uh, early next week, and we'll go over it then, or Monday next week. There's an old time well dig bigger. There's uh, just flood irrigation. Who cares, the water came 400 miles, who cares, let's just dump it out on the ground and let it just flow to where it needs. It can evaporate, leave salts behind, it can waterlog the soil. Uh, it'll, we'll waste 50% of it. Here's the actual subsidence. If you overcharge, overdraft, think about it, instead of those spaces between the soil and the sand being filled with water, they're filled with air. And that can compact and it's, one of the problems with groundwater overdraft is subsidence. And that's what this person is standing on there. That's in the San Joaquin Valley. They've had subsidence in certain areas up to above 20 feet. The problem then is once it's compacted, now when you recharge, you don't have as much space to fill back up with water. So it's not as good. It doesn't have the same capacity anymore. Okay, there's where I come from um, in Africa. These water wells are huge, and then folks either carry the water literally on their heads like this, or in five gallon cans, or they go five miles down into the riverbed, pick up the water and bring it back to their homes. Problem is, other than this situation where this is a well, and the water is probably not that contaminated, in the river it's highly contaminated, mostly from dirt. Uh, so you've got all kinds of water issues, water disease issues happening. Water myths, real quick, groundwater myths. We got, what, another five, seven minutes? Uh, there are no sub subterranean lakes or underground rivers. There are fractures between rocks and kind of underground pools, especially if you get up in the mountains here. My friend who lives up on, uh, on Bowen Ranch Road, he's pulling his water from at about 100 foot. So he must be into some kind of fracture in the rock with pool of water and something's going on. Just a localized little area. It wouldn't be a pool of water, but it would be sediments with a bunch of water sitting in there. Uh, it's not locked away. It's a renewable resource. It's not unlimited, but it can be overdrafted and that can cause subsidence. Percolation through the soil. 
does not clean out everything. A lot of people, going back to Sam's uh, septic tank idea, I was even taught and kind of, didn't, I knew better, but anyway, they, that after it comes out of the septic tank, the anaerobic doesn't treat it very well, goes into the leach lines and then goes into the ground, the soil will take out all the bad stuff. Well, to a certain extent it does a decent thing, but it doesn't take out pesticides. It doesn't take out synthetic fertilizers. It doesn't take out all the pharmaceuticals that we're taking. Okay? It doesn't take out all the bleaches and the solvents that we're using, right? You clean your motorcycle and you want to make it look nice and peachy clean, so you spray it with that degreaser, right? Where does that go? It goes right on the ground. It doesn't take that out, okay? That's getting accumulated in our supply. When we were at Mitsubishi last week, same sort of thing, mercury, certain stuff with a long half-life that never is biologically degraded starts accumulating. And then it starts accumulating in us because we're top of the food chain. So we start bio-magnifying the stuff, okay? And that's happening. And that's why certain things, especially frogs and amphibians that are very sensitive because they have a layer of moisture on them and they get all this input, are starting to have some real issues. Mostly we think because of these water pollution from pharmaceuticals. So when you, when you see those frogs with two heads, they're probably not eating GMOs. They probably have water contamination. And all of this kind of gets mixed up. Like, right? what, what caused it? But, and a lot of the disease issues that I think we're seeing these days growing, and I'm not, I'm not uh, disputing that there might be some increases in some certain kinds of diseases and disorders, but my personal opinion and others is it's a lot of this in our water. We're kind of doing it to ourselves. And it's not necessarily GMOs or something like that directly, but actually just playing in our water, especially in Lubbock Barshman. Okay, so monitoring local water levels. We already did this, you guys saw this. This is us this week. I managed to import one measly little photo that was up in Lucerne Valley. Um, there's the, the measurement, there's the little thing that beeped, the, 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 the monitoring tape that tells you how deep the well well. Very critical. That's all put on a GIS and then geographic information system, then we start making decisions. Where should we recharge? Where do we need to start cutting back? Because the Mojave Water Agency also has some muscle. And the way the muscle works is the judge looks at the data every year, goes to a judge in San Bernardino County, looks at the data and says, you know what, Newbury Springs, you guys are still overdrafting. So we're gonna cut another two and a half percent of your water rights. So Newbury Springs right now, if you started off with 100 acre feet water right, you're down to 50, approximately 50. They've had a 50% ramp down. You'll hear this word a lot, ramp down. And that's because we're just saying as a community, as, as the judge on behalf of the community says, you guys have got to cut back, okay? That's why all these conservation measures, and there's a, there's a conservation lecture in there for you guys by Nick Schneider that you guys should look at it, the video if you're interested it's on it's going to be on your on your blackboard okay there's the watershed right right is that the watershed could be the watershed yeah but it's a watershed come on nobody knows what a watershed is Here's the, here's the uh, water levels. We've looked at this already. You'll be talking about this more uh, tomorrow. Monitor this. this. These are called hydroclines um, or hydrographs. We're measuring where the water is underground, right? Very, very critical to look at this over time. There's all the monitoring wells in the Victor Valley area. 6,000 of them across the whole. This is across the whole thing with that they're looking at. They monitor them very seriously, all of them, twice a year. Uh, key ones are done monthly. Yeah. And some of them, as we saw, have actual telemetry where they're actually sending data continuously. Yeah. 
Withdrawing groundwater, advantages. Okay, real quick, useful for drinking and irrigation, yeah. If we want to, if we want to live, right? Those poor people in Africa and irrigation. Exists almost everywhere. Renewable if not over pump or contaminated. Cheaper to extract than most surface water. How about that? It's easier to pump it out of the ground than to pump it from, from a lake, okay? Disadvantages, aquifer depletion, sinking of land. Some deeper wells are non-renewable and also might be contaminated, right? Pollution of aquifers last decades or centuries. Talk to Hinkley PG&E about that, right? They spent hundreds of million dollars. That's the most expensive water pollution issue in the world, they tell me, right? They have still to this day, they have 60, 60 people working directly on that project, highly paid, 200 people working indirectly. Yet once you've polluted it, it's a big deal to clean it up. Okay, groundwater depletion. How do we use more water efficiently? We've done a great job locally on conservation landscape, cash for grass, buying back people's grass and paying them for it, uh, educating people, uh, subsidizing water conservation, okay? So they'll give you, there, in, there was a giveaway this weekend in Apple Valley Rancho's Liberty Water District where you could get toilets if you lived in, in their jurisdiction, okay? Limit number of the wells, they really start to think about this, okay? And this is a big deal locally, big concern, okay? Stop growing water-intensive crops in dry areas. When we go out, we'll visit harder farms where they're growing pistachios instead of alfalfa, because pistachios have a higher economic yield, uh, potentially, but actually take less water, half as much water, okay? Control. Raise prices, okay? We've got these tiered price systems, right? So just because you use more, more water, you're going to pay more. But no, you, well, once you get over a certain level, you pay more, more per gallon. And those go up very rapidly. The people that have a pool, I mean, who of you guys have heard lake, locally, lake, lately, people locally with a three, $400 per month water bill? Not that uncommon. In San Diego, 500 is not very common, uncommon. You, you've got to watch. They, they hit you in the pocketbook. Build rain garden. Use permeable paving material. Okay, so the place so the water can go through it. This barrier is really bad at this. Twice since I've worked here, three times, we've had three, four foot flood of water come around that corner next to that market up on the hill. Do you remember last two years ago when that guy got washed? Can you believe that? I still don't even believe that this guy lived. You know what happened? And we'll end here. The guy got, he was on the other side, he got out of his car apparently. He got washed in the floodwater uh, channel underneath Bear Valley Road and he came out somewhere over here in the, in the Victor Valley Lake and he lived. Right? I read it in the paper, I don't believe it, but I read it in the paper. And I, huh? <laughs> Crazy. All right, so large dams and reservoirs, you can read about this. I'm just gonna quickly show you that we, the very important, there's lots, there's the state water project, there they are. We've got some of the biggest in the world. And then finally, we're gonna talk about irrigation. There will be a, uh, a video for you guys to watch on irrigation by, by Tony Walters, one of our ex-students and water use and waste. Pay attention to this. It's really important what you can do. Remember, main part of sustainability is what responsibility can you take? And then flooding. Uh, I just wanted to show you that we have our own flood water control dams. There's that uh, clearing of forests or, or, uh, or, or, or fire, denuding our watersheds. So right here, Roy Chua, where is it? Deep Creek, right here. Right there is our flood control dam. And that turkey that I was talking about from our church, he buried his Jeep right there. Okay, but people come up here and hang out and have a great time. But this is a flood control dam. It prevents 
massive flooding from Deep Creek to take us out. When I first got here, I'm going to say, not when I first got here, but 18 years ago or so, I don't know if you guys, well, you guys aren't even that old, but the houses were being taken out right beyond the college here at Spring Valley Lake, just dropping off into the Mojave River from, from the floods. Okay? All right, so that's it, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.